The bipolar nature of season two continues. This one's bipolar within itself because this is one of those weird episodes that works in spite of itself because there's actually several logical loopholes and you can tell that they hadn't quite thought out several elements of the plot and yet, despite that, somehow the episode's actually good. Now, it's kind of obvious, you know, going back through it with rumination, you know, analysis mode on why this episode is good. It's because it's a culture study and it's a character study. So we get some good world building and we get some good character stuff. This is probably our first real Riker episode. We've had Riker showcased before, but we've never really dug into Riker as a character. This is when we start to see a little bit more about him, the individual. In fact, he gives a single line towards the beginning of this episode, I want to do it because it's never been done before, which speaks a lot to William Riker, the one we will get to know over the years. <clears throat> now, <laughs> I don't have much to say about the behind-the-scenes aspect of this. Several things went into this, and several things... There were a lot of issues along the way. Um... This is the first time they, they did several new set things uh, they will actually end up reusing and then readjusting and then re reusing several of the Klingon sets in the future. And this is our first real, no really look at the Klingons. I mean, yeah, we saw the crazy Klingons earlier in uh, the episode I don't remember the name of. <laughs> it's back in season one. And, but this is our first, like, okay, here's the Klingons culturally. Now, this is interesting because if you're paying attention, this is the first time the Klingons as a culture are being established in the pattern that they will eventually grow into. The space Vikings, to just put it as simply as I possibly can. If you're paying attention, this is actually different from the two other perspectives of the Klingons. Um, one of which we saw back in TOS, and one of which we will actually see in the future, technically, in Star Trek VI. But... Getting ahead of all that. I'm, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not going to do my big discussion on honor yet. Quick aside. <laughs> I just feel like pointing it out. I've always planned to do a big discussion on Klingon honor and the honor system, but I was going to do it later on in the show because it's more relevant later on in the show. Now, I watch sci-fi debris. I've been pretty open about this before uh, when I have spare time, which is not all that often. And I noticed that he had put out a, a, a discussion on Klingon honor like a few weeks a few weeks ago, I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> he actually beat me to the punch on this one. Usually I end up beating him to the punch, but this time he got me. Anyways, <clears throat> let's talk about Mordok and Menden. So Mordok was the guy back in Coming of Age. Was that the episode? Uh, it was the one with Wesley where he was doing... It was a surprisingly good episode, as I mentioned when I went through it. And they brought back the same actor, who is John Putch. I want to give him some special praise because he actually does a surprisingly good job of portraying someone who is... He hits a nice balance of sure of himself, completely awkward, and slightly off, which adds a bit of an alien tone to him. So he does a good job with the role, and I want to give him praise for that. I also am amused. They, call, they flat out call attention to the fact that, oh, aren't you the guy from season one? Uh, no, but we're from the same genome or whatever, so obviously we'd look alike. It's literally the same actor in the exact same prosthetic because they already had built the Benzite mask, and, or not mask, but you know the, the facial mold for him, that actor. So they're like, hey, come back and play a Benzite. But they had to, now this is actually funny. The original intent was to have this be Mordok, but then they realized, well, that doesn't work. Mordok was in Starfleet and joining the Academy. There's no way he'd be here like a couple months later on, as an ensign on the ship. So we have to do something to explain this away. So they have Wesley ask what is effectively a very dumb question specifically to prompt exposition. This is a fairly common writing trope. Someone says something stupid so that they can be corrected by another character for the sake of the audience. Um, which is kind of something I want to talk about. There are a lot of lines in this episode that feel like they weren't really thought out all that well. Which, again, is why I mentioned that this episode kind of succeeds in spite of itself. Let me discuss the first thing that I had grief with this when I was a kid, and I still have partial grief with as an adult, having gone through with analysis mode on. Um, Mendon is a good character. I like what they do with him. But they can't seem to decide if he's in Starfleet or not. Let me explain what I mean by this. Several lines of dialogue make it pretty clear that he is, in fact, an ensign in Starfleet. 
And then several lines of dialogue, and, and some presentation, I'll talk about that in a moment too, uh, make it clear that he's actually not a part of Starfleet, and he's part of the Benzite fleet, or whatever. That he's used to serving on a fully Benzite ship, with a fully Benzite crew, and therefore is having issues with this. Also, um, this is a minor point, but I find it hysterical. They mentioned twice in this episode how they have to, to have Mendon go through indoctrination in order to be properly acclimated to the ship, which A, obviously doesn't frickin' work, given the events of the episode, but B, has slightly different connotations than it used to. I'm, I'm sorry, after Mass Effect, I can't see that word and think of it the same. It's like assimilation. I mean, it's not actually a really horrible word when you think about it, but post-Star Trek, it's hard to think of assimilation as anything else, right? Anyways. So, let me, let me point to the biggest thing. I, I, I hinted at it a little bit ago. Mendon is in a Starfleet uniform with an ensign pip. And I made, a, I made a point of double-checking that just to make sure I wasn't just thinking that up. So, as a kid, when I'm watching this, I'm like, okay, hang on. If this guy is a member of Starfleet, I don't care that he's from a separate culture, he went through years of academy to learn these procedures and policies and how the ship functions. I know, I'm not going to get into the military thing, but regardless of whether Starfleet's a military or not, this is obviously a ship with a protocol and function to it, Right? They have a chain of command, they have uh, procedures for communication and operation. How would he not know all of this? Now, <laughs> despite the episode's partial insistence that he is, in fact, a member of Starfleet, this will make sense if you consider the fact that he is not a member of Starfleet, because, let me ask you this, why would a member of Starfleet be here on part of the Officers Exchange Program? That's what prompts the whole point of the episode. Mendon comes here as part of that, and then Riker volunteers for another one to reach out to the Klingons. The Klingons, excuse me, I don't know why I clipped that word there. Right? So it makes more sense if he's from a Benzite ship, but then why is he... Eh. Now, as I was thinking about this throughout the episode, I came up with a compromise that helps to explain this way. Let me be clear, I don't think the writers thought this through. Like, it, there's just several little logical issues. It's all little stuff, but you can tell the writers of this episode didn't quite know where they were going with certain things, and really just wanted to focus on the Riker issues and the Riker plot. No no shame in it, but there it is. <laughs> but if I'm willing to give this episode credence, which I'm not, I would say that he is actually part of Starfleet in an all-Benzite ship. In other words, that... Uh, let me put this slightly... Uh, I, I think it's later. I'm trying to remember when exactly it is, but there's a line somewhere, and I can't remember where it is, where someone asks if... I think it was actually earlier, sorry. It's back in Encounter at Farpoint. When someone asks if Data's uh, doctorate, I want to say, you know, his, his rank is honorific. Now, I bring that up <clears throat> because that helps to establish the idea that within the Federation, at least, and possibly in Starfleet itself, the possibility exists of basically being made an ensign even though you haven't actually gone through the chops to make ensign. And we know the Federation plays politics, right? I mean, that's true even here in Season 2 of TNG, and it will certainly be true in the future. So the idea is prompted that maybe there's an, an you know, the Benzite people have reached out and they say, hey, we have the, the ship and crew, and Starfleet's like, yes, we will bring them into Starfleet as part of an exchange program, and they will become, you know, they'll technically be part of the Starfleet chain of command, but it's your ship. Now, we know that there's something, this is actually mentioned in DS9, I want to say, where there's an all Vulcan, or maybe it's an Enterprise, I don't remember, forgive me, but somewhere they mentioned there's an all Vulcan ship of, with, you know, a Vulcan ship with all Vulcan crew. So we know this isn't completely unheard of as a concept. And that would help to explain why it is that he isn't familiar with how to operate on a Starfleet vessel, while at the same time, technically, is a member of Starfleet. That's the best I got. <laughs> I'm curious what thoughts you have, other than the obvious out-of-character things, like in-character way of smoothing this over. Let's get to the other thing that the episode wants to do. The episode wants this to be the first peek at the Klingons, which makes no goddamn sense no matter how you think about it. It has been 80 years since in, uh, Undiscovered Country. Now, granted, Star Trek VI wasn't made yet as of this point in time. Uh, that'll be much later in Season 4, I want to say? 4 or 5, I can't remember when exactly. Please forgive me. Um, hasn't happened yet. So... <laughs> 
as of this point in time, there's still a really big gap between what is effectively the last Klingons we've had, which is Star Trek 1 and Star Trek 3, and of course the original series and the animated series, if you're even counting the animated series, and then these guys, the Klingons we've seen basically twice before, like ever. So from a out-of-character perspective, it makes perfect sense. We really want to showcase the Klingons and the Klingon culture and really dig into them. A, it's never really been done before, not to the extent that we are going to be doing both in this episode and in future episodes, but B, because the Klingons are no longer the bad guys, so now we need to show that in, in a more concrete way other than having Worf on the bridge. So it makes perfect sense. The problem is, it's been 80 years! <laughs> There's several comments in this episode. <clears throat> One of them is that no Federation personnel has ever served on a Klingon vessel. Now, I find that incredibly hard to believe. It's possible, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you're telling me that in eight decades, roughly, if we're willing to be generous, maybe more like six, in decades, you know, at the absolute minimum, it's been 20 years since the Klingons and the Federations have been tight, right? Ever since the Enterprise C. One of my viewers actually brought this up in a comment of an episode that at this point will have gone live like a month ago um, about the idea that there's just this weird 20-year gap in Star Trek history where we know like nothing. The Cardassian War happened there. The Zinkethi conflict happened there. Uh, the Klingons and the, and the Federation solidified their alliance. You know, a lot of events happened in that 20-year gap, but we know basically nothing about them. In fact, that's also when, when Picard was captain of the Stargazer for a huge period of time. And that's a period of time when there was no Enterprise for what is effectively the only period in Starfleet history. It's weird that there's just this 20-year gap. But getting back to my point, this is, this is what happens when you don't plan out a timeline in advance, by the way. This is one of the consequences of doing uh, backloaded storytelling. So, for at least for the last 20 years, the Klingons of the Federation have been looking at each other like, uh, we cool? Yeah, we're cool. And over those 20 years, no one has ever wanted to serve on a, on, a, on a Klingon vessel. No one of any race, never mind human. No Federation personnel has served on a Klingon vessel at all. As, and keep in mind, the, exp the exchange program is not new. In fact, it's, it's common enough that when it's suggested, a Klingon ship that just happens to be in the area is like, yeah, sure, we'll take them on board, why not? Because they already know the exchange program exists. It's already a thing that's been happening for a while. Why has this never happened in 20 years? I'm sorry to keep hammering this point on, but I want you to think very carefully about what was happening in your real life 20 years ago. I want you to think about all the people you've met and all the places you've been to and all the things you've done and all the things you've learned and how the world has changed, how the new games, new concepts, new books, new movies, how Star Trek itself has changed in the last 20 years. <laughs> right? I mean, you see where I'm going. This would have been 98 uh, as of the time I'm recording this. 1998 it was 20 years ago. Think about that for a second. <laughs> All of that that's happened. No one? Really? I hate to keep hammering on this point, but it, it, it's, I'm just making this point because it feels like nobody thought this through. Which brings me to my next point. <clears throat> they comment on how the Klingons are secretly Sith. I should probably clarify that for a second. Anybody who is found no longer capable of committing their duty or, like, they're either insane or they're, they're too weak. Worf specifically says too weak is an option. Uh, they need to be relieved of duty. So it is the duty, the job of, their, of the person below them to assassinate them, and that's their word, by the way, in order to ensure that things keep going smoothly. And then they, everyone, and we all go up in rank, to, to quote Chekhov. And then there's this comment they make. Riker says, I'm surprised that works. And then, then Worf says, well, their system has worked for centuries. Why? See, that's the thing. There are several times, this is true in Star Wars as well. In fact, a lot of long-term fictional works have a thing where basically there's something that if you sit back and think about it logically, it shouldn't work long-term, but it does because they tell us it does without any proper reasoning. The only explanation I've ever heard, and I, I wish I'd come up with this, for why the Klingon system works at all is because is, is the idea that they have an enormously huge birth rate. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea, legitimately. Uh, 
Now, that being said, as I already mentioned, this is very Riker. I want to do it because no one else has ever done it before. He just volunteers like that. That is very Riker. And it is worth noting that Riker throws himself into this. I want to give special praise to Jonathan Frakes. He's actually a pretty decent actor. Not the best. But he is a decent actor, and he has a lot of natural charisma to him. It's served him very well as a director ever since. It's, it's, it's kind of natural that Frakes would kind of slide into the director slot and has basically been in the director slot in the last 20 years as a consequence of this. Because he's got the natural charisma, and he can get people's attention and drag it and move it and pull, you know, pull good performance out of people. He knows how to do good camera work, too. I'll be pointing this out when we start to see episodes directed by Frakes. Regardless... It, this is the first time that he gets to really shine in this series, in my opinion. Uh, feel free to debate this as ever. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. But I think this is the first time we get to see Frakes stretch. We've seen Patrick Stewart stretch a little. We've seen Spiner stretch a few times. We've seen Marina Sardis stretch once. <laughs> Maybe twice. You know. Come on, give her some more rolls. <laughs> um, now, I also... So I'm going to... I, I, wow, I guess I don't actually have anything to really say about Mendon. I'm just checking my notes here. Oh, I'm wrong. There's one other thing I want to mention about Mendon really quick. He mentions how he has not completed his analysis and resolution, that both of those are critical on Benzite crew for Benzite protocols on a Benzite ship. You find something, you finish, you, you know, you search it thoroughly, as thoroughly as you feel is necessary, and you have a resolution. Then you bring it up to someone. It's a minor point, but it, to me it brings to mind why an all-Benzite ship might be present within Starfleet. Because that, to me, implies a completely different cultural or societal norm than, well, than Federation norm, for lack of a better way to put that. That's... I don't have the proper words because I'm an idiot, but it's individualistic. It's emphasizing the individual to a significant degree. Not in a bad way. But the idea is, you find something wrong, you fix it. You don't even bring it to anybody's attention until you have resolved it. Or have reached a point, this is implied, or have reached a point where you have determined that you cannot solve it. And therefore, that's when you bring it up to other people. The Starfleet policy is basically the exact opposite of that. Anytime anything happens, you bring it up so that the aggregate group can pull together knowledge, resources, and skills in order to try and solve the dilemma as an aggregate. And I'm not saying either of these are better or worse than each other, but it's an interesting contrast compared to each other. It makes it thus make more sense why a Benzite would be part of the Officer Exchange Program, because the whole point is to show that completely different protocol system cultural norms from the other. That's the whole point of that kind of exchange program thing. That's what that term implies. So... I like that idea. I, I, it would be interesting to see a Benzite ship and how it would function in reality. I, I'm not actually 100% sure. I'd, I'd love to explore this idea more. Maybe like have like a one-off or, or like a side story or something set on a Benzite ship to show how it functions. It would even be interesting if there's some kind of competition about this. Picture this, if you will. Same situation as in the episode. There's this weird microorganism, except it's an all-Benzite crew on an all-Benzite ship. So, Mendon notices it, and I'm sure other people would too. One or two other people, right? Maybe someone on sensors, maybe someone on scanners. You know, someone else notices this. This is a maybe, of course, because no one else noticed it on the Enterprise. But bear with me for a second. So let's say three or four people notice this. None of them say anything. They just start working on the program. It's like, okay, analysis, 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 analysis. And then whichever one basically is the one to speak up first wins. Now, it's not like they, they win literal. It's not like they're like, yeah, we get a bonus for having done this. But you could see how there's some kind of societal brownie points or more praise or more prestige or, or whatever vague you know, emotional term you want to use for this for the person who manages to successfully analyze and then resolve the problem first. And at that point, the others would probably then be like, oh, yes, I, I was working that as well. Good job. You got there before me. You know, that kind of a thing. 
I also want to say that, I feel like I'm saying this a lot on TNG, uh, John Putch manages to add a nice little bit of added dimension to what would otherwise be a very arrogant and irritating character. Don't worry, I know for a fact we'll be mentioning ar- arrogant characters at least one more time in Season 2 of TNG, so yay. Let's switch over to the Klingon plot, which is arguably the main plot. Now, first of all, as we can see, the alien bounty hunter from X-Files has once again infiltrated yet another place, the Klingons in this case. But I do have to give special praise to Clagg. He works quite well. At first, you look at him and he feels like he's going to be the completely stereotypical, I am an obstinate individual. You know, I am the, the obstinate, I, I, I don't like him because he's different or whatever. But that's not where they go with him. Instead, he is the one to stand up and challenge Riker, and it is Riker who is the one who pushes back, because Riker starts to, basically uses this as an experience to start to learn cultural norms amongst the Klingons. One of the biggest things that will always be true amongst Klingon culture from basically this point onwards, it's not honor. Well, it could be considered honor. No. It is responding to challenges. I've actually kind of commented on this before. It's the idea that if you say blah, my job is, you know, as as a typical Federation mindset, my my mentality would be like, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, I I don't think that's particularly fair and blah, 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 blah. That's not what a Klingon expects. That's not what a Klingon wants, even. What a Klingon is doing when they provoke you is deliberately seeing your response. Your response determines their reaction. It's a very common thing. It's, it's, it's a thing in real-life society norms. It's just Klingons are a little bit more overt and obvious about it. Ha <laughs> ha, plunk. You are expected to then turn around and ha <laughs> ha, plunk back. At least, if that's the kind of person you are. And the people who can fake it, Gowron, excuse me, they have a better chance at succeeding than other people. Regardless, so Riker manages to slide in there nicely and, and establishes a rather natural, weirdly... It's, it, it's, there's a good dynamic between Clagg and Riker. It's nice to see that, because it needs to be there. We need to see the Klingon learning about the, the human, and we need to see the human learning about the Klingon. We need both sides of this to make this a complete puzzle. So his inclusion to the story was excellent. And credit to the actor. Um, I usually don't praise this gentleman, you know, the alien bounty hunter, for his excellent acting skills, but he does a good job with this. Funnily enough, we've actually already seen him on DS9, haven't we? Anyways, he's everywhere, I'm telling you. The, uh, <laughs> the, um, the, let's talk about honor really quick. Just really quick. I'm not going to go into all depth in this. I have felt since I was a teenager that when Klingons say the word honor, that's not what they mean. They don't mean honorable conduct. They don't mean chivalrous action. They don't mean decency. They don't mean respect or any other words that we, here in the real world, would tend to associate with the word honor. Instead, I feel like there's two other words that best uh, associate with the way that the Klingons use the word honor. The first is the word that's actually mentioned in this episode. It's usefulness. Honor is how useful you are to yourself or to your family or to your ship or to your clan or to the empire as a whole. You have done great honor this day, right? Or you have honored your ship or that kind of a thing. The other, of course, is the, let's call it the social currency thing, which I'm going to leave that discussion for later because that doesn't even really come up in this episode. But that usefulness, that is very much on display. You are only as, as significant as you are useful. There's a wonderful little bit. I love the dinner scene. I love the dinner scene. It's my favorite scene in the whole episode. It's... <laughs> the word I want to use to describe it is, of course, incredibly inaccurate. It's very human. The dynamic between the Klingon crew and Riker is fantastic. Riker, who is very much out of his element, is nevertheless doing... Like, it's, he's trying very hard not just to roll with the punches but to know when to punch back, to, to, to acclimate. There's an old phrase, and I'm going to get some flack for this, but it's a phrase I feel is very accurate here. It's called, all things to all men. The idea is you don't choose one response scenario to every situation you encounter. You look at the situation, you look at the people, you look at the circumstances, you look at their culture, and you respond to them in a way that makes sense, Right? 
You don't come up to walk up to a Krogan and start being like, oh, listen, I was wondering if there'd be... No, you walk up to a Krogan and you headbutt him. Right? Because you change your response vector based on the target of said response. So we see Riker pulling that sort of adaptability very, very well. Um, again, huge props to Frakes and to, and to the guy who played... I'm going to look at his name real quick. This is bothering me. What's your name? <laughs> Clag, Clag, what's his name? Clag is played by Brian Thompson. There we go. <laughs> I always leave that right there just in case I need to look something up for these because it's happened a few times. Of, eh. um, Brian Thompson does a good job. Uh, Frakes does a good job. It also gets... A, it, it has some good atmosphere. It has lots of little touches in the performances of the characters. Um, I like the pseudo-flirting with the with the Klingon woman. Uh, I don't know her name. In fact, I'm not sure they even give her a name. I like... There's this one little bit where the gentleman says, My father died at the Battle of Such and Such. And he does that little thing I just did. It's not that subtle, but it's also the kind of thing you're not really supposed to notice. It's just a little thing. He actually pushes up his chest and straightens his shoulders a bit when he says he died at this battle before he goes back to his normal slouching position. Just to kind of have that little visual indicator. This is uh, directed by Bob Bowman, so you can kind of see his touches here. Little indicator of, you know, how, how much it means to him that his father died in this battle. You know, little stuff like that. Also, I can't help but point out how hilarious it is that Riker is the one to make the argument, but he's your father. I know, I know. Backloaded storytelling. We haven't even written Riker's father yet, but it is funny in context, or in hindsight, I should say. Excuse me. Um, I also like... <laughs> so earlier on, I didn't quite comment on this, but it's relevant for this scene as well. Uh, the props department uh, went down to an Asian market, picked up a whole bunch of stuff. Organs, squid, you know, noodles, just a whole bunch of Asian food and didn't cook some of it, and cooked others of it, and that's how they produced the Klingon food. Funnily enough, later on, they would do other things in order to properly uh, visually represent gach. But in this episode, you can actually see how there's basically just a string pulling the noodles, because it's just noodles along. It's like, they, they weren't moving last time I ate them. It's the first time he's actually seen dis disturbed here. But once again, we see that this is Riker, the man who is... Well, he's driven. He's ambitious. He wants to do the things that others haven't because he wants to do that. He wants to be the one in the record books, which is funny in hindsight considering how much Riker will be in the record books for his actions across the series of this show. So he looks at this gach, and he doesn't eat it at first. And pay attention to that. And then they have this whole discussion. They talk about family. They talk about the honor. They talk about the usefulness. And then he goes ahead and actually starts to eat some of the uh, presumably still moving gach. Because, you know, a few days ago, I didn't know how to eat gach. It's an interesting insight, and it shows... What I like most about it is the dynamic going both directions. The Klingons learning about humans, and the humans learning about Klingons, or human, I should say, in this case. My favorite line, and this is one that was actually called out by Maurice Hurley as well, weirdly enough, is the line about... Uh, i got to be honest, I was going to say the thing, same thing about you guys. I never really imagined a Klingon laughing, because Worf doesn't really laugh all that often. He will do it periodically, but he's not much of a laugher. Klingons, however, oh, they're a raucous bunch. <laughs> they're Vikings, after all. Anywho, so it's a great scene. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and bring something up. I mentioned how certain parts of this episode just aren't really well thought out. Where did this microorganism come from? Think about this logically for a second. This microorganism doubles its size every 15 minutes. That's the, uh, that's the statistic that Data mentions. And we see how much it has a deleterious effect on Hull, right? Because of the such and such in the Hull. I forget the specifics on that one. So this is the kind of thing that's going to be a problem within minutes and hours, right? Right? Where did it come from? The captain himself flat out says, we have not had contact with any other ship recently except for the Enterprise. But they clearly have it before interacting with the Enterprise. This is what I mean by this. It's not really relevant, but clearly no one actually bothered to think about where this comes from. Which is a damn shame, because it's kind of critical to the episode and its, and its structure. Which brings me to my next point. Why is the captain an idiot? The captain flat out says, why no longer matters. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, what? The idea of someone who... I, I know, I know. We've had people in real-life militaries like this, so this isn't unbelievable. It's just It just smacks my gob that a leader of a military craft, because there's no denying the, the Pach is actually a military craft, is the kind of person who's willing to say, why no longer matters, I'm going to attack our closest ally and possibly ignite a war, because I think they might have attacked me with a super weapon, even though there's no evidence whatsoever about that. <laughs> what? Now, <clears throat> that being said, I do very much like how Clagg, the, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, the second officer, uses his slightly increased understanding of human culture to reason why this is not an attack, at the very least by Riker. And I love that because the guy says, hey, they sent him to die. And he says, well, yeah, that would make sense if he was me or you, but he's not. They don't do that like that, you know? And it's nice to see that perspective, to see them understanding. Because a little bit too often, and this will happen in the future as well, some Klingons will basically say, Oh, I, I think this incredibly stupid thing because you are weak. Instead, what we see is, well, I don't think this incredibly stupid thing because they are different. What they're saying is fairly similar, but you can see how the intonation and the intent is completely different. One of the other things I want to mention is that <laughs> I love how the captain goes to Riker and says, you will tell me everything about the Enterprise. And he says, no. And Riker just pushes back just as hard, which is good. Because A, it's Riker. I don't think he would have done this anyways. But B, I don't actually think Riker knew this was a test. Because it was a test. The captain admits it. If you had said anything, I would have called you a traitor. Your word would have been worthless. In fact, the captain even flat out says, how can I trust your word if you've already broken it? And he says, no, I'm not breaking my word. If you lead us into battle, I will be your first officer on your ship, and I will die with you. But I am not for swearing my previous oath. He, through action, demonstrates his oath. I like that. Very Klingon thing to do in, in a good way. So then... Riker gives this wonderful little bit, and we have what is probably the best constructed scene with regards to tension in the episode. Riker suggests we get within 40 kilocams or whatever, in order to, or 40,000 kilometers, something like that, in order to, to have the, the best chance of actually hitting them. They all agree, so okay, let's go. And then we cut over to you know them, and they're like, okay, if we're going to beam them aboard, we have to get within 40,000 kilometers. And you can't tell me Riker didn't know about that distance. <laughs> so then Riker openly and obviously activates the transponder and the captain's like give that to me oh okay it's not a weapon there you go <laughs> and he's grinning in some of the scenes he's trying to hide it but you can just see him kind of grinning he's like yeah no this, this is working out perfectly and then what's funny is after he doesn't after he lets the grin drop at his own cleverness he puts on the stone wall this is Captain Riker. You're going to surrender immediately. You know, he's just very Klingon about it. You're going to drop the cloak. You're going to hail them. You are going to surrender immediately. Do you understand? It's, it's some nice stuff. I like that. I do have to mention that I find it ridiculous, the idea that the Pak is going to be a threat to the Enterprise, but that's, that's, that's something that's been, that comes up too often in this show. A bird of prey is not that strong of a ship. I know there's like 70 bird of prey, but it stands true. <laughs> Now, what I also like is that Picard picks up on what Riker is doing instantly. There's no hesitation there. There's no, what's going on? There's no, oh, Captain Riker, what are you doing? Or number one, what's the meaning of this? None of that happens. He says, Picard, surrender. Picard nods, slowly, sl slowly builds into a grin and says, we will lower shields and surrender as, as ordered. Just like that. Now, I like this for two reasons. One, it demonstrates some of his trust in his first officer. But two, if I'm not mistaken, this is the very first time we see Picard's beginning of understanding of Klingon culture. As weird as this may sound, Picard will be very involved in the Klingon way and Klingon politics at the highest level throughout the course of this series. So, this is the first time we see him dipping his toe into the water, so to speak. Last thing I want to mention before I chop off here, I love how Riker really does demonstrate a bit of an understanding about Klingon culture, because what he did to the captain was fairly duplicitous. Not quite the Klingon way, 
But again, that's because, as he points out, I didn't want your ship long term. He could have had it. Riker could have, this is a weird word to use here, but he could have legally, in Klingon culture, he could have murdered the captain, taken command, and just had that ship for his own. He could have just done that and been in the right to do so. And that would have been upheld. But that's not what he wanted. So he had to use trickery. But the captain needs to reassert himself somehow. So you'll notice that Riker, the captain says, get out of my, get him, get him, get rid of him, blah, blah, blah. And Riker just could have left and could have just gone off the ship right at that moment. But instead, he does the growl that we've heard Worf done a couple of times and juts out his chin at the captain. A clear, I'm going to, I'm contesting you thing. Because he lets the captain hit him. Doesn't try to defend himself, doesn't try to fight back. He allows the captain to regain eh, honor and to save face in the wake of the situation. It's a nice little touch. I kind of wish Clagg hadn't then immediately said, you clearly understand us, because, I mean, we get it. But it's a nice little touch. Good episode overall, in spite of itself. I do hope you've enjoyed my ruminations here, and I'll be seeing you guys next time.